this week's lecture is going to be all about color psychology, the way that we can use color to affect people's behaviors and moods, and the way that certain colors will affect our outlook and experience of a space. Uses of color should, to manipulate space should be secondary. The primary thing to know is the many ways you and others respond to color. Colors attract you or distract you. Colors make you feel good. Colors attract members of the opposite sex or the same sex. They cause you to want to eat more, less, or not at all. Colors cause you to overvalue a product, undervalue a product, buy or not buy. They affect your decision-making process all day long. One of the more interesting graphics that I found when putting these lectures together was this one, where it goes into the varying brands and companies that we experience every day and the colors that they use and what those colors subconsciously convey about the company. Whether it's true or not, this is how the company wants to be viewed. So those companies, for example, that chose purple, purple, according to color psychology, represents creativity, imagination, and even wisdom. And so the colors that have purple in their brand logos, like the Sci-Fi Channel, um, Taco Bell, Cadbury, Hallmark, Yahoo, they all want to convey a sense of imaginativity and creativity. Yellow conveys optimism. So the companies that choose yellow want to have you feel comfortable with them, want to have you think that they are a good solution, that they are happy and cheerful and they'll make you feel that way too. So we've got, interestingly, a lot of oil companies. We've got um, McDonald's and UPS and Sprint, lots of companies with yellow because it's a, a very upbeat, optimistic color. Companies that want to encourage diversity and want to make their audience feel that they are diverse will use colors from all of the spectral hues. So NBC, Google, Windows, eBay, those multicolored logos in a way convey diversity. And when you think about what you can find on a Google search or when you go on eBay, anything and everything is sort of there at your fingertips. And then on the opposite end of that, Color, um, companies that use achromatic schemes, they don't use color, they use black, white, and gray. Psychologically, this conveys balance. This conveys neutrality. So Apple, um, Honda, Puma, Nike, the New York Times, all of those companies that don't use color are doing that intentionally as well. Another fun thing that the, uh, the Color Research Council does is that they project the color of the year. So every year there's a new color. And I started paying attention to it in about 2017. So the way that these colors are forecasted is that these councils look at the state of the world, look at what is trending and what is popular, and they propose a color in some ways to support that and in other ways to counteract it. So the color green in 2017 came about because this color council saw that, you know, we were in a tumultuous social and political environment. Green symbolizes reconnecting, it symbolizes nature and healing. So they saw that the world was sort of thrown in balance or imbalance, and they wanted a color that would help it heal. And so the color for 2017 was a color called greenery. And it showed up in fashion, in accessories, in the home front, in our interior design um, plans. And what's wonderful about these color forecasts is that the color doesn't have to be everywhere. It could be just a little hint of it. So, um, you know, think about walking through Target and you see their, their little home section and everybody loves Target for one reason or the other. And that little home section will have a lot of sort of neutral things that'll go with everything, 
but then they'll have one or two colors that they're focusing on. It might be coral, it might be um, yellow, it might be uh, brown, but it's those little accents that you can purchase and bring into your home or wear on your body. And it doesn't mean you're committing wholly to this idea. It just means that that color has become appealing to you. And, and part of it is because it's been put in front of you in that way. So here's more green used in the, the fashion industry. And then 2018 saw the color ultraviolet come in, which was a blue-based purple that takes our awareness and potential to a higher level. So this was a color that was chosen to help inspire people, to make them dream bigger, to make them think about the world outside and how much more that they could do. It was supposed to be inspirational. And so ultraviolet shows up in everything from nail color to clothing and again to the home interiors. So here in these two images, we have ultraviolet being used. On the left, it's used to color the entire room almost from wall to floor to sofa, and even the patterns on the drapes and the sofa pillows. On the right, we have ultraviolet being used as a larger, as part of a larger blue green palette, sort of as like a nice um, contrast to the otherwise pseudo monochromatic blue green. So here you can see it in large doses and also in small doses. Again, this is not something that everybody is supposed to jump on the bandwagon with. It's not something that you're supposed to just wholeheartedly give yourself over to, but there are colors that we respond to positively based on our, our backgrounds, our personalities, our upbringings. So for people who love purple, you know, here was an, a moment where you could find a lot of purple on the market. And for people that just wanted sort of like a, a new refreshing um, kind of pop of color or interesting new pattern, you were seeing a lot of purple worked into, you know, upholstery patterns and textiles. Um, home goods is another good example of this. You know, the, the color palettes change so often with the season and home goods gets in affordable, trendy fashion colors for the home. So Again, if you don't want to paint your whole room purple, you could go to Home Goods and get some pillows that happen to have purple on them. Um, and also not saying you have to jump on the trend, but you probably ended up buying something that had a little purple on it when purple was the projected color of the year. In 2019, we had a, a pink, a warm pink called Living Coral. And this was a color that they felt would um, encourage human connections and social connections. So that was their, their reasoning behind living coral. And here again, you can see it's on headphones and rugs and light fixtures and record players. And it's a, it's a fun color. Again, it might not be something that you wanna use in your space entirely, but it's a way to add some interest and to refresh. In 2020, last year, the color was classic blue. And blue conveys fidelity, loyalty, honesty. We are coming into a new age with 2020. And of course, we all know what 2020 was all about. It was all about COVID. But we were coming into this new sort of political era, this new era for the US at least. And so the color forecasting group, the Pantone Institute, wanted to convey strength and honesty and reliability. And so they chose classic blue. And blue is a preferred color for a lot of people. A lot of people love the color blue. Even if they don't have it in their homes, they still like the color. They still find the color pleasing. Nature has provided living creatures with a variety of innate responses, color response being one of the most important. Flowers of a certain color attract the proper insects for pollination. Insects are specifically colored to ward off predators, whether the insect is poisonous or not. We are born with color sensitivities, and some sensitivities develop along the way. The previously discussed rods and cones sense light and color and communicate with the brain where the seeing really occurs. 
the ability of the cones to work in complex combinations accounts for the color variations we see. One unit of measure called the Lovibon tintometer with its various filters indicates approximately 9 million possible colors to be detected. And that's quite a few. The cones send their information along the optic neurons to the brain, but not all the information travels to the brain. 20% of it goes to the pituitary gland, the master endocrine gland of the body. The gland does not appear to detect anything from the eye except for color. Studies indicate that there is a glandular response to color. When the pituitary is stimulated in certain ways, it sends chemical signals to other endocrine glands in the body. The signal sent out determines which gland will function. So looking at our diagram here, the pituitary is itty bitty, but depending on how it's stimulated, it can send alerts and signals to other parts of the body, like the adrenal cortex, bones, kidneys, the uterus, uh, the ovaries, testes, the thyroid. So Given that it's very, very small, it has an incredible effect on a lot of the parts of our body, and it can be stimulated by color. For example, when the eye sees red, it sends a signal to the adrenal medulla, one of a pair of endocrine glands at the top of the kidneys. The adrenal medulla then secretes adrenaline, which causes the body to go into a state of arousal. Emotions such as excitement, fear, or anger are all enhanced by this chemical secretion. In the presence of red, people will eat more, eat longer, and will pay more for food than in the presence of any other color. Restaurants have known this and have taken advantage of it. The entire restaurant doesn't have to be red. It can be the napkins, the waiter's aprons, the flowers on the table, or the upholstery. All people will respond to red because it is inborn. Another example of a glandular response to color is the one that halts the response to red. When the eye sees a very vivid pink, Baker Miller pink, named for researchers who made the discovery, the brain secretes norepinephrine, the chemical that inhibits production of adrenaline. The effect of being in an environment of this color is that the body's ability to remain in a state of anger is halted. Here is that Baker Miller pink. It's Barbie pink. It's Pepto-Bismol pink. It is pink. And this combats senses of aggression. So much so that a lot of high security Men's prison facilities have begun using Baker Miller pink to combat the aggression of their inmates. Not only do they paint the cells pink, but they also make the inmates wear pink scrubs and pink underwear. While this has been proven to combat aggression, I also think that if you were to make a male who is aggressive, who is hyper-masculine, who has this, you know, kind of machismo about him, if you made him wear pink, that would sort of take the air out of his sails right away, just because of our psychological relationship to the color pink. We generally associate pink with girls. It's becoming more and more of an antiquated color association but a lot of people equate it with girls and femininity and women. And so if you make a man wear pink, you might as well make him wear a dress as far as they're concerned. So I think that the pink use by these facilities is sort of multi-layered. Some of our color responses are learned. Many things happen to individuals during their growth and development and significant events and situations often imprint certain associations in your memory that are linked to later responses to that color. For example, 
Your grandmother may have worn a certain color and you now associate it with a nurturing, caring environment. Your most dreaded teacher may have worn a color that is now associated with unpleasant memories. Speaking to my personal experience, my grandmother had her living room decorated in the late 1970s. And she kept it for about 20 years because she bought quality and none of it wore out. And why should I have something replaced if it's still good? So my grandmother's living room kind of looked like this. Warm colors, warm wood tones, wall-to-wall -wall carpet. In the 21st century, we look at this room and we think, oh my gosh, that is so dated. It looks so old fashioned, it's not trending, I hate that color, X, Y, Z. Whatever reason a person might have to dislike this room. I, however, look at this room and it makes me feel nostalgic because of the colors, because of the textures. So that's a learned response. Based on my experience, I find this room to be welcoming. Not everyone is gonna share that experience and I will certainly not fight you on the fact that it is dated and out of style but it reminds me of happy times. It reminds me of Christmases at grandma's house and Thanksgiving. And this is what her living room looked like for about 20 years. Though these situations and each subconscious are highly individual, most people in the same socioeconomic circumstances share the same experiences and some of the same responses. Therefore, we are able to know what values certain groups place on certain colors. Some responses are geographic. People who spend time in certain locations have conditioned responses to colors that are native to that area. A person in Georgia may grow tired of washing red clay dust out of their clothing and thus dislike any color that reminds them of Georgia red clay. On the contrary, someone may move from Florida to Wisconsin and still choose to decorate their home with rattan furniture and tropical fabrics because it reminds them of good times in their previous home. Responses to color can be regional. If people in a region are fairly isolated and insular, they are very likely to have a system of acceptable and non-acceptable colors. Those living in more cosmopolitan and diverse areas will accept a wider range of colors. Generally, Coastal zones around metropolitan areas have the broadest acceptance of color. A great illustration of this is one of my favorite movies, and it is Tu Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar, which stars Wesley Snipes, John Leguizamo, and the late Patrick Swayze. In the film, for those who have not seen it, three drag queens from New York are making their way to Hollywood, California and their car breaks down in the middle of nowhere. So we have these vibrant technicolor figures thrown into this very bland, forgotten town. And of course, in the movie, they have their way with the town and bring the town back to life. But you can see from this image, we have these three women in front of this beat down, beat up, building with chipping paint and, and sort of unidentifiable sort of neutral wall colors. And then we have color and sophistication and, and personality being shown in these women. Um, of course, the movie is a heightened reality. It's a send up. It would never happen. You would never have three men traveling across country dressed in full drag. That's, that's not how it would happen um, because the movie starts out with these three characters being men. They are doing this as a career. It would just be very uncomfortable to drive cross country dressed up as a woman, uh, or rather as a man dressed up as a woman. So here they are in their local beauty salon, which hasn't been open in years. And then we see another one of the characters interacting with uh, Patrick Swayze's, and you can see how vibrant and colorful being from cosmopolitan New York and being thrown into this Midwestern sort of dust bowl of a little town. And being isolated like this little town is, we see this example of how colors are approved in certain situations and, and frowned on in others. 
how a color will be responded to varies by climate and geography. Our perception of color and its association with temperature is a learned response. A color palette developed in San Diego, for example, may not be received well for a client in Vermont if the designer has not taken into consideration the seasons, environment, and light quality of the Northeast while working in the Southwest. We always wanna put ourselves in the position of the client. We always wanna consider how color will behave in certain light settings and in certain environments. Color can help warm a place up or cool it down. People experience temperature differently in the presence of different colors. As expected, people feel cooler while in cool colors and warmer while in warm colors. Areas of a building that is subject to heat loss or heat gain can be somewhat remedied by the use of the appropriate colors. As we saw earlier, we know that dark colors absorb heat while light colors reflect them. This applies to clothing as well as roof and house colors. Income plays a role in your response to color. Each earning category has certain symbols that go along with it. The type of car you drive, the type of bag you carry, where you get your hair cut, et cetera. Certain colors indicate that you know what is in or appropriate for the group you relate to. So here, we have five categories of tribes, as I call them. You have from left to right, your hipster anthropology girl that you know lives in Silver Lake or thinks she's bohemian. You have your lumber sexual, the guy that dresses like a lumberjack all the time. You have the hipster in the center with um, you know his dreadlocks and his little canvas shoes. You have the preppy, and then you have the the um, Lululemon girl who never is out of her yoga clothes. Even if she never does yoga, she is always wearing yoga clothes. So these are different tribes and there are more, but within each of these different tribes, there are certain colors that are acceptable, certain colors that you would never wear and colors that can kind of define the, uh, the style that you have. Color signals are a form of identification to others as to how in or out you are. To be, a, to be a part of any group, you must indicate that you belong with them. Some groups go so far as to issue a uniform, such as the Boy Scouts or the military, to show common colors for all to see. Within such groups, color often represents advancement in status. And the little photo I have off to the right, if you don't know, is a fantastic late 80s comedy starring Shelley Long called Troop Beverly Hills, where a housewife becomes the new troop leader for a bunch of spoiled little Beverly Hills girls. And of course, there's a heartwarming ending, but very funny. But she kind of goes in and shakes up the cages of all the uh, other troop leaders. When it comes to merchandise, 60% of a buyer's decision is based on color over quality, price, exclusivity, and product guarantee. That is a lot. To think that our decisions can be based on color alone, or rather color in a majority way, is crazy. Because of course we want to buy quality, we want good, good pricing, we want a guarantee of quality. But 60% of our decisions are based on color. What color are we going to go for? And in that respect, what color represents quality and exclusivity and a guarantee? There are colors that represent that to certain demographics. So based on market research, those from lower income or less educated backgrounds tend to appreciate simple colors. And those from a higher income or highly educated background tend to appreciate more complex colors. There are always exceptions to the rule. People have inherent taste. People have a, a, a born eye for certain things. So just because you're low income or less educated does not mean that you can't have a, uh, a, a preference for a certain color that would belong, according to research, in a higher educated category. Always exceptions to the rule. But they do notice that people that are 
less educated, you know, that don't have a college degree, like colors that are simpler. So we'll go into what simple colors are and what complex colors are. Simple colors are those that can be described in two words or less, baby blue, grass green, and so on. Complex colors are expressed with three words or more, blue-gray with a hint of green, for example. Complex colors are said to be muddied or dirty looking, while simple colors are bright and clean. These differences are critical to keep in mind when you are designing. The discount department store that is a standard feature of super centers must stock colors that are quite different than the exclusive department store that is selectively positioned. So think about Walmart or Target or Costco. Those are all discount stores. And then think about Nordstrom and Saks Fifth Avenue. Those are all upmarket stores that are positioned very carefully in the retail environment. So our clean, bright colors we see here in this Marshalls, and I love Marshalls, and I love the home goods too. But if you look at the colors that are used in a Marshalls, where you have a lot of people coming into shop for good deals, for low prices, they have chosen their color to be blue, which as I mentioned, represents trust, loyalty, and quality. So they're choosing blue to represent their store. So the consumer knows that whatever they find at Marshalls is gonna be a good deal, it's gonna be good quality, and they're gonna be happy that they bought it. The stores like Marshalls are also, and Target too, are also very brightly lit, easy to shop, wide aisles. They give you a shopping cart right at the door. They want you to fill it up. It's a different shopping environment compared to a luxury store. And here in this example from the Gap, we have examples of those bright, clean colors, red, white, blue. We don't have any colors that are particularly complex. No color that is hard to describe. As you go into a more upmarket environment, here we have the new look of the Nordstrom stores, you start to get more unique finishes more unique color combinations, something that will be appealing to the Nordstrom shopper or something that will be appealing to the Saks Fifth Avenue shopper, which is what this interior is. So you have luxury finishes, you have colors that are a little more complicated. Um, and by that, I mean, we have a metallic ceiling here. But if you look at it, and if you were actually in the environment, the ceiling would turn from silver to bronze because of the paint finish. And that would be a more complex color. You can't really pinpoint what it is. And so the description becomes complex because you have to put more words into describing it. And then as far as examples of complex colors go, these three images are from an Armani campaign. And if you look at the green, it's blue, but it's also green, but it's also gray. If you look at the pink, it's pink, but it also has a warmth to it. So it's not a true pink. If you look at the blue, it's blue, but if you ask someone else, they might say it's purple. So that's what I mean by complex colors. Still beautiful colors, but theoretically, they will appeal to a smaller demographic and also a more educated demographic. Similar to income level, color response is also an indication of your level of sophistication and education. As you grow in life, you leave some things behind, including colors. The more we experience, the more we change and grow and redefine ourselves. There are, of course, those who refuse change and still hold on to old hairstyles and even old topics of conversation that should have been long buried. You know who these people are and you know that you just need to let them continue doing what they're doing and not try to have an intervention because it's only gonna end poorly. Those that refuse change still use color as an indicator, but it's an obvious statement that says they are unwilling to change with the times and we should always take note of that. For those that do grow, their color palettes become more sophisticated 
as well as more curated, rather than the bright scattershot colors they favored in their youth. They will also find a larger group of colors acceptable, even though they may not use them in daily life. So here's another great graphic on the way that color is used in marketing and products and how it appeals to the different genders. And of course, there's more to study about color than just how genders respond to it. You can also study how different age groups respond to it, how different regions will respond to a certain color. But for the most part, the way that these colors have been described is the way most people find them. So people find green to be peaceful, reflective of health, reflective of growth. People find black to be a sign of credibility, of professionalism. People find orange to be friendly and cheerful. So that's something that goes across the board. So now we'll talk a little bit about how we respond to colors. So red, through its association with fire and blood, is used to represent danger, anger, and violence. For the same reason, it is also associated with affairs of love and passion. In this piece of art, Paul Gauguin's Vision After the Sermon, Jacob wrestles with the angel in a blood-red field of spiritual battle, an apt metaphor for his internal struggle against the will of God. Red is the longest light wave and the most symbolic color of the spectrum. In the West, it connotes sex, danger, villainy, and even the devil. In Asia, it's a symbol of good luck, prosperity, and celebration. In India, it's the color of the goddess Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth and beauty. In many ancient civilizations' creation legends, the earth was depicted as the color red. This comes as no surprise since the most widespread pigment on the earth's surface is iron oxide, which changes to red when exposed to the air. In Chinese tradition, the first man was molded from a cavity in a human-shaped space. Gradually, the red clay carried by the rain filled up the space, and the soil was brought to life by the heat of the sun's rays. In Hebrew tradition, the first man was created from red clay. God named him Adam, because in Hebrew, dom signifies blood, and adama means land of men. In Latin, Adamus translates into the man of the red earth. In Polynesian tradition, the woman was the first living being on earth, created from the red sands of the island's shores. When red fills the field of vision, it sends the pituitary gland to work, as previously explained. As a result of the altered chemical state, many things will be experienced differently. Red is said to enhance some flavors. Studies show you eat more and eat for a longer period of time in a red environment. Red is also known to alter the perception of fragrance. When an infant is born, its first color responses are for black and white. During its first 18 months, other color sensitivities will develop, and the first color to be recognized is red. Red stimulates the brain more than any other color, fostering connections between the neurons. A child will retain a preference for red objects until roughly the age of five. The eye sees all colors as having either a yellow or a blue base. Therefore, there are two types of reds, yellow-based reds, such as tomato, and blue-based reds, such as raspberry. Males inherit a preference for yellow-based reds. They do this from infancy onward. They will look at yellow-based reds first and longest. Females inherit a preference for blue-based reds, looking at them first and longest. Herein is our first color attractive to both genders, inherited in both genders, yet depending on the base of the color, you will attract or please members of the same sex or opposite sex. This preference runs the entire red family and throughout all values of red. 
While women have liberty when it comes to color, especially in clothing, men are still somewhat restrained. Men will buy a dark red necktie, go to a medium red for casual clothing, and pinks still have a cultural implication that prevents men from openly consuming them, no matter how much they like them or how good they might look on them. The more a man is cultured and educated, the more he will accept blue-based reds, pinks, and burgundies, but he will always return to yellow-based reds out of habit or nostalgia. Women seem to start off being far more cultured and open than men are to all colors, making decisions based on how they look in a color and how the environment benefits from certain colors. Pink, though a soft diluted red, causes people to value certain things, at times perceiving them to be worth more than they actually cost. Sweet foods taste better off of a pink plate. Cosmetics that come from pink packaging are considered to be of better quality. Cosmetic procedures done in the pink are perceived to be more effective and more valuable. And even pink gyms give patrons a sense of muscle gain up to 10%, even when nothing has changed post-workout. In the case of darker reds, you begin to lose the appeal of lower socioeconomic classes while attracting a wealthier group. So here in this interior, we have a darker red palette. And as we said, this darker burgundy brick color is a color that's not going to appeal to a broad audience. It's gonna to appeal to a more specialized group. So when you do do a interior and the client asks for this, chances are it's gonna be a client that wants something unique. They want something that they really like. They're not paying attention to trends and it's gonna be a very specialized interior. It does create a darker feeling in the room. They've counteracted it by the use of white on the ceilings and moldings, but our upholstery is darker, the wall covering or the wall paint is dark. So it has a different feeling. It's a little more moody than a red interior that's brighter. Here we see the same effect one more time with a darker red wall treatment as well as ceiling treatment. And it's brightened a little bit by that tile floor, but still this is for a client that has a specific want for this type of red, because as we said, it's gonna appeal to a smaller demographic. There is a precedent in nature for using red as a warning sign. Black widow spiders and some snakes are marked with red through evolution to ward off predators. Some birds and other mammals use red to attract the opposite sex. Red is the first color you lose vision for at twilight, and it is not the color seen at the greatest distance, despite being used on traffic signals. In this situation, yellow is the color seen at the greatest distance. In Japan, pink symbolizes the peony, the imperial flower of Japan, as well as spring and youth. In India, it represents hope, happiness, celebration, and the Hindu deity Ganesh. In the US, it is a youthful color considered for babies and young girls, though its presence in men's fashion has grown. Its presence in interiors has also grown as pink has been found to be a very calming color. Though pink is made from red and white, it is the opposite effect on the body. It slows the heart and even stimulates sugar cravings. The most feminine of colors, light pink is associated with femininity, innocence, and romance. Hot pink signals fun, frivolity, and sensual behavior. So here we have the oft photographed London restaurant called Sketch done entirely in this soft feminine pink. The walls, the booths, which are done in velvet and leather, and the chairs are all done in pink. The floor, if you look it up online, is actually a really interesting zigzag pattern of multicolored marble tiles. But overall, the restaurant is done in a feminine color, yet I would not say the furniture looks particularly feminine. It's kind of modern style furniture. And pink, as we discussed, can also cause you to overvalue something. So maybe they're doing this on purpose so they can charge a little bit more. 
And pink also can affect the way things taste. And here in this residential dining room, we have these fuchsia or hot pink walls and those, or, or that color, as we said, conveys fun and frivolity. And this definitely has a sense of fun to it. The color is very unexpected. It's a nice contrast to the colors in the paintings. And then we also have kind of like a deep plum and black being used. So it is a very fun, unexpected dining room. On to orange, Mark Rothko, the American abstract expressionist artist, encouraged viewers to stand close to his large paintings so that they became spiritually immersed in the experience of color. Orange and yellow from 1956 is the door to an inferno of color with a radiant energy. Orange symbolizes creativity, change, energy, and endurance. As a secondary color, it combines elements of the colors used to mix it, the passion of red with the energy and joy of yellow. Orange is adventurous, extroverted, and celebratory. It is cheerful, stimulates the appetite, and promotes self-motivation. In Asia, it is the symbolic color of Buddhism and represents happiness and celebration. In Europe, it is a favored color viewed as fun and happy. In the US, it represents autumn, Thanksgiving, sports teams, and most of us associate it with cheap products. It is North America's least favorite color. Culturally, we prefer brown-based oranges like persimmon and copper. True orange is 50% red and 50% yellow, making it the color of a pumpkin. Colors can be classifying or declassifying. This is an interesting theory. A classifying color is one that holds position or alters appeal so that only a limited number of people will respond to it positively. A declassifying color is one that moves its position downward and extends appeal to a broader number of people. Orange is a declassifying color. When combined with any color of a dark value, such as burgundy, which would appeal to only a limited number of people, it will declassify the burgundy and cause a greater number of people to be attracted to the combination. Interestingly also, putting orange with primary red encourages people to eat more quickly. So think about fast food restaurants in that instance. Forest green is a classifying color appealing to about 3% of the upper income population. You can use this color as a high status indicator by using it maybe in hotels and fine dining restaurants and exclude lower income groups. If you want to add lower income groups back, you must declassify the green, and orange is a great declassifier. Orange attracts attention with its brazen color, but it indicates informality and low cost. When combined with a strong blue, orange gives the impression of great strength. So think about all the cleaning products that you might see out there that are orange and blue. That color combination has been chosen specifically to convey the strength of the product. Orange also has a seasonal connotation, autumn leaves, jack-o'-lanterns, orange juice, and roaring fires. Used as an interior color, orange brings to mind these tactile elements on a subconscious level. Orange lacks formality in interiors and dress. Since it's a declassifier, it has no real power on its own. So here we have a kind of a burnt orange interior. It's a bedroom. It has, a, it has a, a sense of warmth to it. There's a little bit of a coziness. It's being paired up with brown, but orange is not formal. The room is symmetrically arranged. We have a chinoiserie style wallpaper, which is usually used for formal spaces, but by doing the background in orange, it kind of makes the room a little more casual, if you will, just because orange does not convey formality. In this living room, we have another kind of persimmon orange being used on the sofa and chair, and then the wall and draperies. So we've committed to this color. It's a great bold color statement, especially with the floral of the chair and the yellow of the opposing chair, but it's not a formal color. So if you look at the way the room is configured, it's done in a very off-center, informal way. 
And even our art installation is done very casually with this gallery wall installation. Now you can certainly do a formal interior with orange, but it just won't have that feeling because people don't consider orange to be a formal color, no matter how you arrange the room. In this instance, we have used the lightest shade of orange, reducing it to almost a peach to paint the walls and fireplace. And then we are using the darkest shade of that orange for draperies. And then our sofas and chairs are done in, in sort of a light blue green, like a light turquoise. And it works very nicely together. So we've got orange and blue, which are our complements. And because they have been tempered by the addition of white, it makes them much more palatable to view together. Because remember, complements will exaggerate each other. So in this space, we're really watering the orange down. Because if you think about it, if you painted this whole interior with the same intense orange, it would be a lot to look at. It might even feel uncomfortable because of all that intense color. So this is a way to use a nice color that you love that's gonna have a fun um, feeling to it, but do it in a way that's not as aggressive or abrasive. On to yellow. Yellow is the color of the sun, the life support of our planet. As such, it has come to represent life, energy, happiness, hope, and wisdom. Van Gogh's Sunflowers of 1889 is painted almost entirely with yellow and without shadows. It expresses the radiance of sunshine rather than giving an anatomical description of the flowers. Van Gogh also used yellow as the symbol of hope and friendship as the Sunflower series was painted to welcome his friend Paul Gauguin to his home in Arles. Yellow represents joy, creativity, optimism, and sunshine. It is also the most ambiguous color as it is associated with disgrace, deceit, betrayal, and cowardice. In Asia, it's the color of the Chinese emperor and also symbolizes wealth and honor. In Japan, it represents courage. In the West, it stands for hope, caution and cowardice. For Apache Indians, it symbolizes the east and the rising sun. And in the Bible, Judas wore a yellow cloak when he betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Yellow is the fastest color for your eye to see. It is the first color you see in any situation involving the most complex seeing process for the eye. It involves an equal number of red and green cones being stimulated simultaneously. Interestingly, people who drive yellow cars are less likely to be hit by another car when in traffic. And yellow will also improve your memory. Yellow is used in nature to symbolize that something is new. Think of flower buds, new leaves, and blades of grass. It is also used in nature as a warning. Insects that can bite or sting are generally yellow with black markings. Think of yellow jackets, bumblebees, dart frogs, and gila monsters. Research indicates we develop a pulling back reaction to things that are yellow and black to avoid the sting we anticipate. Yellow in nature is also a temporary color as it will turn to green in plants and the offending insect will fly off. Yellow is thought to be a gender neutral color when it comes to painting a nursery, but studies show that infants cry more in a yellow room than any other color. We also know that if there is more than one child in the room, they will cry in concert. Next time, try a green for the nursery as it is a soothing color tied to nature. For each year of maturity, people use less yellow. Starting around the seventh year, children lessen their focus on yellow and begin to view other colors with more interest. In the presence of yellow, someone who is likely to lose their temper will do so faster and for a longer duration than any other color. People who require chemical mood modifiers will need larger and more frequent doses in a yellow environment. And people who lose control of muscle movement, such as with Parkinson's disease, will experience greater loss in a yellow environment. Yellow is also a declassifying color, indicating temporariness. In merchandising, it is the most likely color to get quick attention. In real estate, you are more likely to sell a property if there's some yellow on or near the exterior. 
Yellow also tells us to use caution in wayfinding and signage. For interiors, yellow tends to work well in transitional spaces, places that you pass through, the foyer, hallways, laundry rooms, and as accent walls you might sit in front of. Yellow is not good for bathrooms used for doing your makeup, as the reflected light will alter what you perceive. So here we have a living room done in this daffodil marigold yellow. There's not a lot of it being used. There's a lot of white in the woodwork and the ceiling, and then our floor is not yellow and none of our furniture is really yellow, but it's used as a brightening element for this interior. Perhaps this room faces north and you want the room to appear brighter and sunnier, you might paint it yellow. Yellow is also one of the most volatile colors to use when painting because it is one of the most highly changeable colors when it comes to light quality. So if you look at the room in the morning when you're getting morning sun, it'll look one color. If you look at the room in the evening, it'll look another color. It changes its personality based on the light. Even if you've got consistent light in the room, if you have a shadowy corner, that corner will look like a different color. So yellow can be a hard color to work with. So be aware. Here in this bedroom, we have kind of a yellow green being used and bedrooms are highly personal. There is a, a degree of personal preference as to what you wanna use. You might not use a color in the bedroom that you would wanna use elsewhere in the house because your bedroom is your space. So you might love the color yellow green, regardless of what it means, regardless of it being a declassifier or hard color to use, you might just like this color. So here we see it again with that green tint to it. It does add light and a bit of happiness to a space, but as we said, it can also make you feel a little bit unstable or aggravated if that is your disposition. On to blue. Blue is the coolest and most calming of all colors. As the color of the sky, it has been used since ancient times to represent heaven. In classical mythology, it is the color associated with Venus and Jupiter. In Christianity, it becomes the symbol of the Virgin Mary, Queen of Heaven. As the color of the ocean, it suggests freshness, purity, and hygiene. In Asia, blue is associated with the medicine Buddha, healing and compassion. In Judaism, it is the color of the Star of David and the Israeli flag. Blue is the preferred color for the majority of the U.S., being representative of quality, authority, and trust. For the Hindu religion, it is the color of Krishna, symbolizing love, mercy, truth, and heaven. For the Catholic Church, it's the color of Madonna and fidelity. In religion, blue is a non-denominational color, appearing with the same hue and intensity in Christianity, Buddhism, Judaism, and Hinduism. It also carries the same meaning in all religions, representing love, mercy, and the heavens. Blue is considered a calming color, but one blue specifically, cardiac blue, which is a strong sky blue, does this much better than others. Here's that cardiac blue. Sort of a mid-tone blue, a little bit lighter than you know, our color wheel blue. When cardiac blue is in your field of vision, the brain secretes at least 11 tranquilizing hormones. It is called cardiac blue because some hospitals use it to calm the fears of its patients. It is far better to calm the body with its own natural system than to inject it with chemicals, if at all possible. A very pale blue will encourage fantasy and flights of the mind. This color seems to be a good selection for classrooms that encourage creative thinking. This is most likely a learned response as the color has been a constant presence in our evolution and has held many mysteries that we have discovered over time. Blue aids in weight loss. The simplest explanation being that you do not eat or drink blue foods, save for blueberries. We have inherited a rejection of blue in foods. Objects cast in blue light are viewed as unappetizing 
and blue turns off our appetites. So food served on a blue plate, with the exception of eggs, will not be completely consumed. It's not often that the properties associated with the color can be traced to a specific origin, but in the case of dark blue, it can. In 431, Mary, mother of Jesus Christ in the Christian church, was elevated to queen of heaven. She was illustrated from that point on in blue. The choice of showing her in intense blue was most likely made because the color was so very precious. At that time, blue was created by grinding lapis lazuli, a semi-precious stone that cost as much as gold, into a fine powder to be used as a pigment. Through the years, Mary was repeatedly illustrated in blue. The color eventually became less costly, but by then it had become her color. Mary's properties became the properties of blue, trustworthiness, responsibility, and knowledge. This blue more specifically is known as royal blue. Here we see dark blue used in this beach style interior. It's of course not so heavy feeling because we have the use of white kind of contrasting it and giving it a sense of airiness. But you can see the commitment to blue is very strong in this room with the striped upholstery and rugs and even the blue surfboard and collection of vases. Here in a more formal setting with lots of classical additions like moldings and pillars, we see blue being used again in its darker form. Both rooms use blue and white together, giving us kind of a nautical um, illusion because we think of blue and white as being somewhat beachy or somewhat ocean-like. But here we see it used in a more formal setting, just as elegantly, just as nicely. And with blue being the favorite color in the United States, it's not hard to see why so many people choose to use it because it is a favored color. Here we have a very dark royal blue being used in this advertisement from Z Gallery. Um, I was looking for something that was very intense. And of course, Z Gallery would, would have that color. So you see it used in upholstery and carpeting. It is contrasted by the white table, but we have this very deep blue, which has to some maybe a luxurious appeal because of the look of it, because it's such a deep, beautiful um, night sky color. Others might find it too dark, but blue has a lot of flexibility. And if your client loves blue, or if it represents them in some way, there's lots of different blues that you can choose from, and you will get different effects from each one. The blue-green family of color is among the most interesting for the response to this color group changes drastically as the value changes. People associate prestige with dark blue-green, and it is equally responded to by men and women. Mid-value blue-green is an attention-getting color, attracting both sexes. Pale blue greens, like aqua and turquoise, are viewed as trend colors and fade in and out of fashion. Using them indicates that you are aware or blissfully unaware of current fashions and interiors. The eye notices them quickly, but not everybody favors them, especially men. Aqua and turquoise is used regionally, most often close to water in the South and the Southwest, where it was used by Native Americans in jewelry and art. Aqua has been used with orange as a contrast color. The aqua is attention grabbing and the orange is a declassifier. Here we have this interior done in shades of blue green. Blue green is one of my favorite colors, if not my favorite color. And it has a very soothing watery look to it. So that might be why I like it so much. But I think that's why people do like it because it can have this cooling effect, but also it, it gives you the sense of kind of being in water. Unlike true blue, which is more of a sky, a sky feeling. So here, a gorgeous interior done in shades of blue green. Here, a deeper kind of peacock green being used in this um, vignette here with this beautiful color on the wall. We also see it repeated somewhat in this um, headboard. And then it's complemented by this very lovely dark blue. So quite a smart color combination there. And you could also say that blue green kind of encompasses both values of blue and green. Blue being the favorite color, blue being 
symbolic of, of trust and fidelity and, and loyalty, and then green being healing and, uh, and nurturing. So putting those two together might create the perfect combination. Next up is green. Green is the color of nature and all that is associated with health and growth. However, it is also used to represent more negative traits, such as envy and inexperience. Cezanne's painting, The Bridge at Mansi, is a formal composition of horizontal, vertical, and diagonal lines, relieved by the arches of the bridge. What transforms this rigid architectural structure into a woodland sanctuary is the myriad of greens that bathe the scene in emerald light. In China, amusingly, wearing a green hat signifies adultery in the relationship between husband and wife. In the West, it symbolizes money in St. Patrick. It is the symbol of Ireland. And when the economy is soft, green emerges as a trend color, as we saw with our color of 2017. The most used color in nature is green, and it's probably the most popular color for interiors outside of neutrals and white. Green is cooling, calming, and friendly. People generally react favorably to green as it is an inborn reaction. We do not know if there is a glandular response to the color, but there are physical responses when we are in green environments. Green makes people feel tended and secure and helps those dealing with separation anxiety feel more at ease. Green also lowers blood pressure. We eat and drink green and it is associated with health and freshness. The green light reflected from green garments or green walls, however, can make you look sickly. So beware of green. The darkest value of green appeals to the smallest amount of the population, about 3%. And this amount, this 3% is also the wealthiest. Hunter and forest green are highly useful classifiers. Pale green appeals to a broader scope of people. Yellow green has the least appeal in the green family, generally used only as accents or as trend colors. So here we have this traditional interior done in yellow green. Um, this is a room by the American interior decorator, Billy Haynes, and it was inspired by this antique 18th century Chinese wallpaper, which is celery green. And he installed it and sort of built the room around it. So the room was inspired by the, uh, the acquisition of that antique wallpaper, but it is a very acquired taste, this yellow green. It can maybe make you feel a little bit edgy. Um, it can also appear bright depending on the room that it's put into but it is one of the lesser favored greens. This darker green from the American interior decorator, Billy Baldwin, is again, the other side of the spectrum, not exactly appealing to the mass market, but this was done for his own home. And Baldwin was a great decorator for small spaces. He worked in New York, he had to work in smaller interiors. And so he had some tricks up his sleeve as far as making those interiors more livable one of them was to use smaller scale furniture. So you can see here he has these two rather small love seats in his living room. And then the other trick was to use the same color for the walls and the upholstery so that the upholstered pieces would kind of blend into the background and not take up as much visual room. And he did like to use darker colors as well. And with darker colors, it kind of erases the shadows because the walls are already dark. So if you had a, a shady corner, it wouldn't appear as shadowy because it's already a dark corner. So that's what he liked to do. But if you're interested in 1960s interior design, he's definitely one to look at. And then here, another American interior decorator, Dorothy Draper, with one of her rooms at the Greenbrier Hotel. This green borders on like a deep peacock, but it is still green. Um, Draper practiced during the 1940s. Her interiors were very vivid and bright, and she was very bold with her use of color, and people love her for that. People also probably hate her for that, but we'll talk about the people that like her. So the green is actually coming from that oversized floral chintz on the wing chair, but it's, it sort of wraps the room. It's an interesting choice, too, because you can see she did this red carpet, and as we know, green and red are complements. So that room probably hums. You know, you could probably hear it down the hall because of the complementary colors interacting with each other. Next up is purple. Purple is the color of royalty, wealth, and power. 
Historically, purple dyes were rare and expensive, and only the rich and powerful could afford to wear clothing in this luxurious color. Rodokov's 1780 work shows Catherine the Great wearing a gown of purple silk draped in ermine robes and festooned with jewels. Purple is the symbol of royalty, spirituality, creativity, and sensitivity. It is the shortest light white length. It reduces stress and calms hyperactivity. Purple has become uh, a popular color for interiors. And the purple that's being used now is, is what I call like a smoky purple. It's purple that has been grayed down ever so slightly. So we see that in these paint chips off to the side. In Japan, it is the color of the highest abbot of Zen Buddhism. In the West, it is the color of passion, vanity, and bravery. In Catholicism, the cardinal wears purple robes. And in Aztec culture, it is also the color of royalty. Purple is equally loved and disliked, causing it to be used very selectively in everyday life. The color originates from a mollusk that was first used in the ancient world. It would take the harvest of over 12,000 mollusks to reap a few drops of the pigment. This made it the most precious colorant in the world, and it was reserved for kings and nobles. Lower classes were forbidden to wear it. In Aztec culture, pictograms were drawn with yellow to represent common people, and purple paint was used to show royalty and religious leaders. Here to purple interiors, this one kind of a more plummy shade, this one a grayed down purple. As with certain shades of yellow, it is an acquired taste. It's something that is specific to a job. It's not something everybody is going to want but you can create a really beautiful, unique experience by using something as simple as a unique color. Um, personally, I kind of like the smoky gray purple over here. I think it's kind of, you know, sexy and interesting, but this is very interesting as well in this guest room situation. Next up is brown. Brown is the color of earth, wood, and stone. It evokes craftsmanship and the great outdoors. It also represents humility and down-to-earth virtues. Van Gogh's shoes reflect the humble peasant who owned them, and the rugged earthy browns used suggest the hardship and dignity of the owner's occupation as a manual laborer. In Saudi Arabia, there are many words for brown, while in Japan, there are no words for the color. Brown colors are described in relation to tea, wood, and fox colors. In the US, it represents the constant, hearth and home. Brown has a wide range of positive color responses running the entire spectrum of the hue. Because of its natural association, it gets positive, positive responses. People work well in brown-based rooms as there is no stress noted from the color, and it also does not have a strong after image, so there's no eye strain. Brown also does not elicit emotional responses as yellow would, and people feel the same, tended and secure, about brown as they do green. If there is too much yellow in the brown, the negative feelings of yellow will creep in. Remember also that brown is a neutral. It's the product of mixing two complements together. So the brown could have characteristics of the two colors that went into it. Brown does have regional prejudices. In New York, brown objects don't sell well. The color also doesn't do well in tropical climates like Florida. So it most likely doesn't do well in Florida because it's a tropical area. We like our bright, vivid colors. It most likely doesn't do well in New York because New York is very congested and, and uh, dirty, if you will because of all the traffic and the noise. So brown isn't really a color that a New Yorker would really wanna come home to. Brown does well in the Southwest where it is associated with terracotta, brick, and other natural materials that make a home feel warm, friendly, and inviting. Um, another Billy Baldwin, this time his last apartment, which he painted this dark kind of bitter chocolate brown and contrasted it with white furnishings. Again, the use of dark color to kind of make the shadows go away. But brown can be restful. It can be healing and, and calming. But then again, if you don't like brown, it's not going to work for you. 
And here, a mid-tone brown used in this interior. This is a Ralph Lauren interior. Um, there's a lot going on. You know, let's not pull any punches. There are way too many accessories in here. It's just job security for the cleaning lady. But this brown and mid-tone, which we also see in the leather of the sofa, and even the, uh, the shade of that carpet is also kind of comfy and cozy and, and warm feeling. The room is also flooded with light, so it helps to keep the room from feeling too dark. But brown can be very elegant and very earthy, as we see here. Next up is gray, a very popular color right now. Gray is the natural color of some metals and stone, but it is also associated with bad weather, boredom, decay, and old age. Gray is a mixture of black, which to some represents death, and white, which represents peace. And it is the color of ashes and dust. As such, it is also associated with death and mourning. Picasso's Goat Skull Bottle and Candle of 1952 addresses the idea of our mortality. He often painted in monochrome to heighten emotional tone, reserved gray tones for his paintings relating to death or oppression. This painting is believed to be an elegy for Nikolos Boloyanis, a Greek resistance leader executed for treason. Gray signifies indecision, uncertainty, neutrality, safety, camouflage, conservative outlooks, and the status quo. In the West, it is the autumn of one's life. To the Hopi Indians, it's the sum of all colors. And in Nigeria, it's the color of wickedness, sorcery, and death. Gray is sometimes associated with change. It is seen in clouds, smoke and fog, all natural elements that change rapidly. It carries the connotation of a lack of strong feeling, and the abdication of self. Creative people are more creative in gray environments and artistic people are highly and highly educated people respond positively to gray. Gray is a classifier. It is a color that elevates other colors to help them appeal to a higher socioeconomic class. The IC knows after image, after looking at gray, it is the only color with no after effect. Many have a learned prejudice against gray that is based on their geographic location. When someone gravitates towards a gray color palette, they are going through a major transition in their life. When their lives level out, they will gradually add color back into their interiors. So here we have a gray room. Um, it's a nice warm gray. The only thing I really have against this room is that they decided to faux paint exposed brick in the corners. I think that kind of cheapens the look, but it looks nice with the, the weathered wood. It looks nice with the silver finishes. I even like the fact that they painted frames on the wall around their pictures to make the pictures look bigger. Pretty good things going on in this room. The only thing I really don't like is that fake brick. We could do without that. Even their track lighting is cool. Next up is white. White represents peace, purity, and goodness. In 1915, Kazimir Malevich developed a geometric style of abstract art called suprematism. He believed that pure abstract form had a spiritual power to open the mind to the supremacy of pure feeling, and there was no purer color than white. In the West, white is the color of the bride, the good guy, and angels. For the Hindu faith, it's the color of God, sacred cows, the higher castes, and dairy. Hindu men cover themselves in ash to symbolize their renunciation for earthly things into their spiritual rebirth. In Asia, it's the color of mourning, purity, and departed loved ones. White indicates delicacy and refinement. It is a color with numerous positive responses. It is a symbol of purity, chastity, and cleanliness. It also indicates formality, equality, and unity. White is a status symbol. Historically, to keep a white garment clean or a white home spotless, the owner had to employ servants to do the labor. White behaves differently in different climates. In overcast areas, it appears grayed down, and in sunny locations, it can be blinding. White is often manipulated by the addition of color to soften its appearance. White house trim is the most popular option when it comes to architecture and interiors. It's also the easiest to maintain. 
White is a good color for a positive response around food. We eat and drink white and it shows off the colors of food. White in a work environment encourages precision. These interiors are generally well lit and contain few shadows, allowing all aspects of the interior to be seen. So in these few images, we have a view of Halston's apartment. Halston being the 1970s fashion designer who was very well known for his crazy parties and his style. His townhouse features an achromatic palette utilizing white, black, and gray. So it is a very sexy interior, but it also violates a lot of building codes because you'll notice there's no staircase railing and you can just fall right off this ledge, which I'm sure many a person did. Um, during one of his parties. But white conveys clean elegance. And we see that in Halston's interior. Our last color we look at is black. And black in its association with darkness is used to represent death, evil, witchcraft, fear, and mourning. The Widow by Kath Kolwitz is one of a series of prints from a portfolio called Krieg or War, which deals with the wretched human tragedy of World War I. This desolate image shows a grief-stricken wife embracing the memory of her departed husband. In China, black represents water and the black soils of Northern China. In the West, it's the little black dress, the color of mourning and perceived as being sexy. It's also the color of priest robes and nuns habits. In Egypt, it's the color of the Nile Delta soil representing life, growth and well-being. Black is symbolic of night, dignity, sophistication, evil, refinement, and authority. Black carries a lot of visual weight as it absorbs all light, but it also is the least attractive color to our eye since it does not re reflect any light. At one time, it was the only available color for automobiles. Black also depletes energy and promotes introspection. Black has limited uses in interiors. It creates drama, but also makes some poorly lit interiors look like pits. Black works as accents, inlays, and statement furniture pieces. It also works as tile, countertops, and appliances. Architecturally, it's accepted for commercial buildings, but every HOA will hate you for painting your house black. Generally, if you increase the value of a color, it will be abandoned by lower socioeconomic classes with the exception of navy blue and black. All classes of consumer appreciate and see value in those two very dark colors. And the interior we look at to represent black is one of the John Varvatos stores. So finding black interiors is, is kind of hard, but Varvatos, because it is a retail space and because his brand is identified with mu the music industry and rock and roll, he can take this bold um, design decision and paint his stores black. You'll notice that the store is very well lit, has a nice high ceiling, lots of reflected light coming off of lighter surfaces as well as metallic finishes, but he creates kind of a sexy, cool den feeling in his stores by using black on the, the walls. And even the floor is this dark kind of smoked oak, which also kind of looks black. So you can see how the space is kind of engaging and moody because of the color used. And it's not something that you could really do in your own home because this is a retail environment. We've had professional designers create it. And we've also had lighting designers come in and light the space so that it doesn't look like a big old pit. But black can work. You just have to be very judicious with it and also consider that you need to keep it well lit.